Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I focus on root cause healing and oftentimes that starts with the carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. So today is a solo episode. It is episode 300. I know on YouTube, we don't really number our episodes, but this is episode 300. And I wanted to do a little recap of the last 100 episodes. I've interviewed amazing people that will absolutely influence the second version of carnivore cures book. So in this conversation, I'm going to share the top 10 things I learned from the last hundred episodes of Nutrition with Judy. Let's get right into it. Number one, improvements and updates on the carnivore diet. In episode 153, I sat down with Dr. Sean Baker and we talked during World Carnivore Month. I think it was World Carnivore Month number four, or maybe it was number five. Sorry, Dr. Baker, I forgot. But in January, that's when he hosts World Carnivore Month. And we talked about all the changes that are going on in carnivore and the progression that he sees and where we're moving towards as a carnivore diet. We also talked about if fruit is part of a carnivore diet. In episode 186, I sat down with Dr. Mickey Bendor and he made the case of why we are supposed to eat carnivore. He makes the anthropological case for fatty meat and how our ancestors searched for fatty meat and hunted for fatty meat. And that was the prized part of the animal. In episode 161, I sat down with newcomer Anthony Chafee. We discussed and broke down the myths of a lot of the long-term carnivore concerns. Dr. Chafee is a big history buff. And if you listen to our conversation, he breaks down a lot of the history and the arguments of why we are actually meant to eat a pure carnivore diet. As diets progress, there will always be improvements. And just like science and it's evolving, there will always be improvements to a diet. I sat down with Dr. Donald Lehman in episode 183, and we talk about the importance of protein and why eating multiple times a day is probably beneficial to really synthesize protein well. Always do what works for you. But in episode 185, I also share my five-year carnivore experience and some of the top tips and some of the top mistakes I've seen being carnivore. And in that discussion, I also talk further about OMAD and why I'm not the biggest fan. Number two, the second thing I learned in all of these hundred interviews is that groupthink is really a thing. I learned that sharing interviews with Dr. Garrett Smith and Grant Jenneru about the risks of vitamin A toxicity, eating too much liver, and also even copper toxicity can bring opposition and groupthink is very real. I learned some hard lessons of opposition, but time reveals truth. And it's been over a year and a half since I shared this information. And now there are concerns when people are consuming too much liver. And so while it might not be easy to hear oppositions in a diet, sometimes we need these, I guess, sound checks or gut checks on if our diet is making sense. And if we want to progress the diet that we should consider multifactorial facets. Adding to the dangers of liver, I had several interviews around 156, and I interviewed with Dr. David Perlmutter, who just released the book Drop Acid, and also with Dr. Richard Johnson. In these discussions, we talk about the risks of eating high purine foods, which liver is high in purines. Unfortunately, sardines are too, and so is salmon roe. But in these foods, there is a case that it can affect your uric acid levels and then possibly gout. And it all depends on the context of your diet. Now, uric acid does get nuanced with ketogenic carnivore. So I highly recommend watching the episode with Dr. Richard Johnson. And you can also take a look at my uric acid decision tree. There are some cases where eating too much fruit with liver and even more than liver, just also sardines and even possibly salmon roe that has a lot of purine counts. It can cause worsening of metabolic syndrome as well as uric acid and gout. This will be very individualized. And I hope that my uric acid decision tree helps you determine that that will be in the show notes in episode 179. I had the honor of sitting down with Dr. Gary Fecky. We talked a lot about the trouble of fructose and adding fruits to our highly carnivorous or ketogenic diet. And then in episode 181, I talked even further about the mechanics of fructose with Dr. Robert Lustig. He explains how orange juice is possibly even worse than soda. And that just because vitamin C is in orange juice doesn't make orange juice safe. In one of my more popular episodes, episode 164 and a half, 
I shared why I think beef plus liver does not work long-term and why some people decided to quit the carnivore diet that were once advocates because of the way that they were eating. I highly recommend watching it on YouTube as there are so many graphics and the importance of if you're going to eat carnivore long-term, you may as well try to eat a rainbow of meats. In episode 168, I sat down with Bart K and we talked all about the Randall cycle. We talked about how it's dangerous to mix a lot of two energy sources, fat and carbs, and using too much of it will eventually cause metabolic syndrome. I wonder what that means for Ray Peters that use a lot of fat from animals and also uses a lot of carbohydrates from orange juice and other fruit. I also wonder what that means for their vitamin A levels. Only time will tell. In episodes 119 and 121, I sat down with Dr. Robert Sives and we talk about what concerns he has for long-term carnivores and things he's seen especially blood markers that seem to go the wrong way. Now, I don't fully agree with Dr. Robert Sives, and I don't see exactly what he recommends. But in our conversation, he talked about how people should eat lean protein. Well, it's been a while since he's recommended that. And I think he's kind of gone back on that as working with clients one on one or patients one on one, you realize and you learn very quickly that lean meat days are very, very difficult and impractical due on a long term basis. It's a fascinating discussion. And it's something to consider if carnivore isn't fully working for you. If we want to progress diets, we should put our group think and our dogmatic beliefs aside. I know it's hard when we are trying to advocate for a diet that's not commonly accepted. But being overly zealous for a certain diet and the way it's been and the way it's always should be is not letting the diet progress. When we talk about how liver can have too much vitamin A, and there are studies that back up how vitamin A toxicity is a very real thing, we have to be open to these considerations. Now, I know that it's hard when there are so many advocates out there sharing so many different diets, and how do we know that carnivore is even right? What I recommend to my clients is know your body's inner wisdom. If the diet is working for you and you know you're doing a lot of the things right, then it doesn't matter what other advocates say. If liver is working for you and you're not eating a crazy amount, and what I mean by crazy amount is probably no more than two ounces a week, then maybe liver is okay for you. But always figure out what makes sense. But always, 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 we must learn to stay open because things evolve, things change. And the more that so many different people try this way of eating, we're going to find clues to other things that can improve this way of eating. Number three, PUFAs and high A1C on carnivore. So I have a lot of questions from my carnivore community, as well as my clients that ask about, hey, my A1C is going up slowly on a carnivore diet compared to my ketogenic diet. In episode 147, I sat down with Dr. Bickman. And in episode 167, I sat down with Dr. Paul Mason. In both of those episodes, we talked about insulin resistance, PUFAs, and if we should be fearing PUFAs in our meats, as well as the increasing A1C on a carnivore diet. In summary, don't worry too much about your A1C going up. Now, I don't like A1C to be above 5.5, 5.6 generally, even on a carnivore diet. But if it's even at 5.5, it's typically okay as long as you're not having these crazy swings. And one way you can check that is if you use a CGM. In terms of PUFAs and meats, Dr. Paul Mason does a great job explaining why you shouldn't worry about the meats that have PUFAs even from conventional grocery stores. In my opinion, the whole argument about PUFAs is a bit stretched. Yes, toxic seed oils are not ideal. The average American based on a study was like 30 to 40 pounds of seed oils are consumed in a year. If you're having an occasional seasoning that has a little bit of oil, or once in a while you go out to eat and there's a little bit of seed oil that they cooked your steak with, it's not the end of the world. But when we say that it's just PUFAs, it's not the whole truth. If PUFAs was really what was making us metabolically broken and that's what's making us obese, then we would essentially see all Ray Peters be super slim as Ray Peters are deathly afraid of all levels of PUFAs, even in salmon and possibly even in eggs. But the truth is a lot of the Ray Peter advocates are not slim. So there must be something other than just dodging all PUFAs that is causing metabolic syndrome. So while it's good to consider new research and not fall into group think, I highly recommend doing your own research. Not everyone has the ability to do research, but you can always test having a diet without PUFAs and seeing how your body reacts. And this really leads to part four, corruption and critical thinking. 
another facet of what I learned in the last hundred episodes. In episode 166, I sat down with Brian Sanders and I learned a lot more about how we've been lied to about food. In episode 178, Dr. Gary Fecky talks about all the corruption in our dietary recommendations, how so much of it is monopolized by money and powerful conglomerates. I also interviewed Belinda Fecky, but her interview is not part of this 100 episodes, but I highly recommend you watch that interview when it comes out. I chatted with Matt Boudreau recently about education and the importance of critical thinking. A lot of our issues that happened during the pandemic is because we just blindly followed authority. It's important now than ever that we really use our thinking caps and question a lot of what we hear and what we learn. I say we always start with the Socratic method of why. Why do we believe that? Why do we think that? Why, why, why? The fifth thing I learned is about food sourcing and food scarcity. I interviewed Polyface Farms Joel Salatin in episode 193 about the importance of regenerative agriculture. He talks about truly the balance sheet that nature has. I also sat down with Peter Ballerstedt, who is a big fan of regenerative agriculture, but also believes that you should buy what you can afford. We talk about how climate change and from cows is just simply not true. I sat down with Paleo Valley's Autumn Smith, as well as Peterson Farms' Neil Dudley, and how both of them are working to create products that are of better quality and sourcing for people to heal with food as medicine. And then in episode 160, I sat down with Dr. Bill Schindler and we talked about not just the importance of what meats to eat or what foods to eat, but the how and the why, how do we prepare foods? And just maybe as you heal, you may be able to make your own sourdough bread in the way that nature intended. I'm not saying that everyone needs to eat sourdough bread. I mean, I don't eat sourdough bread, but I'm just saying that maybe if we properly prepared in the way that nature intended, that it won't be as harmful as we think of as bread. It's a hard discussion about regenerative agriculture. For one thing, I support my local farmers, especially that do the regenerative agriculture and that feed their animals the proper diet and that are grass finished and pasture raised. But we have the luxury to be able to do that. And I cannot recommend for my parents who are now retired to be able to go and afford those types of meat. Sure, they can use all of their retirement money, but if they're eating carnivore and living longer, they're going to need money for a longer period. They're healing, and there's not much I can say when their blood work is moving in the right direction. Heal with the meats you can afford and that you enjoy, but as time passes, maybe you can support a local farmer by directly contacting them. But if we are eating less monocropped foods, packaged and ultra highly processed, we're still headed one step in the right direction. Number six. I learned so much about heart disease and insulin resistance in many, many interviews. A lot of the concerns in the carnivore space is, well, what about my cholesterol? What about heart disease? And so I talked to a lot of the experts in this space, cardiologists, people that have created the CAC score that indicate coronary artery risk. So in episode 128, I interviewed Dr. Brett Scher, who is of the diet doctor, and he's a cardiologist. I asked him, what are the best tips for heart health? In episode 143, I interviewed Dr. Philip Ovedia, and he also talks about the seven keys to metabolic health so you don't end up on his surgery table. I had the honor of chatting with Dr. Arthur Agustin. He is the founder of the Coronary Artery Calcium Score, also known as CAC Score, also known as the Agustin Score. If you haven't watched that episode, I highly recommend it on YouTube as he shares his presentations as to how you can detect early onset of pre-pre-diabetes as well as insulin resistance at a young age when you are not showing signs of metabolic syndrome. Well, I guess you are showing signs because one of the signs is that you can pinch some of your belly fat. But before you show blood work of diabetic trends, he shows these ways that you are under the curve and showing signs of metabolic syndrome just about to happen. If you are a person that loves pictures, Dr. Sean O'Mara's episode is super powerful. We talk about how to reduce visceral fat and why it's so important to reduce visceral fat. We talk about insulin resistance and how people with diet, a little bit of sprinting and even possibly eating fermented veggies has helped people reverse a lot of that visceral fat. And finally, I also chatted with Megan Ramos, who's the co-founder of the fasting method with Dr. Jason Funk. We talk about therapeutic fasting, who it's right for, who should try it. If carnivore keto is not working long-term, or if there's just a little bit more that you want to dial into your diet, therapeutic fasting can always be an option. 
Number seven is updates in the keto space, as well as the differences between practitioners and people that are producing content, but don't work with people one-on-one. In episodes 130 and 131, I sat down with Dr. Dom D'Agostino, and we talk about updates in the keto space, how he's changing his diet, and also the, the fear or lack of fear we should have in terms of eating fish and the mercury content. He shares his thoughts on a carnivore diet long term and some of his concerns, as well as even some of the concerns of hypervitaminosis. In episode 152, Dr. Eric Westman shares real life keto in real life. He works with a very poor community that is very obese and has to find ways to make keto work for people that don't have a lot of extra resources. It's very humbling to talk to him and hear how you can still make keto work on maybe ground beef patties. In episode 191, Dr. Annette Bosworth or Dr. Ba shares her simple GKI ratio to do very simply with just a glucose and ketone number, which she calls her Dr. Ba's ratio. She makes a very practical tool for, again, the average person doing a ketogenic diet. She also shares a animal-based product that is beneficial to produce more MCTs. Dr. Brian Lenskis of the Low Carb MD podcast shares how he uses a CGM to balance real life and keto for his individual clients that he works with. When you work with real people, it challenges all your dogmas. Of course, I can always recommend the perfect carnivore diet carnivore harder, remove certain things, remove this, remove that, do this, do that. But it doesn't always play in real life because we are humans and we have real life stressors and real life things that happen and real life scenarios where it challenges our diet. Cause at the core of it, all you want to do is help your clients or patients get better. And for every single person that answer and response will be different. And you will only know that when you work with individual people, number eight, mastering physique and strain training. In episode 135, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Robert Sykes of Keto Savage, and we talked about how to perfect your physique on a ketogenic diet and how you don't need carbs. In episode 146, Menel Hensa Moss, who's an expert in also improving physique, we talk about the differences of strain training and what you can do to maximize your strain training, whether you're a male or a female. In episode 150, I chat with Danny Vega from Fat Fueled Family, and we talk about how to build lean body mass with limited carbs. In the episode with Dr. Brett Scherer, as well as Dr. Sean O'Mara, they both talked about the importance of cardio. I think it's a blend of all exercises that really help you to use different parts of the body. When you build muscle, you will save a lot more lean body mass, which will help you for longevity. But you also want to stretch your heart a little bit where you run a little bit further than you would normally to make sure that you're challenging your heart. I use a blend of both on a weekly basis. And I know there's a lot of carnivores that aren't big fans of cardio, but I think it always makes sense to get your heart rate pretty high to support heart health. Even walking is so beneficial. If you listen to the episode with Dr. Donald Lehman, he talks about how people improve so much by just eating protein and then doing a little bit of physical activity and how it changed these people so much in a study. You don't have to do these crazy workouts to improve your health. Number nine, other levers for root cause healing. This area is so big and near and dear to my heart. There's a whole section where I talked about mind body healing, addictions, mental health. In episode 126, I sat down with Dr. Julia Rutledge, and we talked about the importance of microdosing nutrients and how her studies have shown that they may be more beneficial than using SSRIs and other antidepressant medications. If you microdose certain nutrients, and I think she used supplements to do several of these research studies, but she showed the effect on mental health. Her TED talk got deemed by the higher ups for possibly not being true information. Sounds familiar with a lot of what's going on with censorship. I shared several episodes of Mindset. I interviewed Von Kohler of the MFCEO project. In episode 165, he shares steps to improve your life and the importance of faith. In episode 177, I sat down with Dr. Susan Thompson and we talked about food addiction and how food addiction is very real and how it's so often more difficult to overcome than any drug or alcohol addiction. We are inundated with a lot of information to say food is good and junk food is good and moderation is good. If we sometimes view food as an addiction and use it in an addictive therapy model, we may be able to heal long term. We should always start with the diet. If we don't get the diet, the fundamental part of diet correct, 
it will never really help us move the needle in all other facets. If you're eating a poor diet, there's no way you're going to be able to really improve your sleep. If you're eating a diet riddled with excess sugar and processed foods, you're never really going to be able to manage your stressors. In episode 154 and 155, I chatted with Mary Ruddock about chronic illness and nuances when we use diet as a therapeutic tool. Spoiler alert, it's not just diet and macros that will fix everything. I also chatted with Dr. Natasha McBride, founder of the GAPS diet. She healed her son and reversed her son's autism by healing the gut and using food as medicine. Many, many people have healed with the GAPS diet, which in a strict sense can be a carnivore elimination diet and have healed mental and physical illness and healing the gut. I talked with Dr. Al Dannenberg, episode 137, about why some people may not be healing because they still have toxins in their oral health. If you've ever done root canals or serious dental work, sometimes there are pathogens in our teeth that is inhibiting us from fully getting well. Now, oral health care is a very big expense. So maybe you work with diet first or some supplements or some gut healing before you go down that path. But there are some of my clients that had to go down that oral health path to figure out what was the root cause of why they weren't healing. In terms of root cause healing, I also sat down with Dr. Jessica Petros, where we talked about the importance of detoxing and having our detox pathways open so that we can clear out our system. When we are no longer eating toxic foods, our liver wants to get rid of a lot of the toxins that have been stored in our body. But if we're still exposed to a lot of toxins, imagine what happens within your bloodstream. So it's so important to support our detox pathways. And we talk about that a lot with Dr. Jess. I also talked with a client of mine in episode 138 about breast implant illness. She talks about all the details of a lot of the chemicals that are in breast implants. It's quite scary because certain medications that have a potentially very adverse effect, they put a black box warning label around that medication. If you don't know, breast implants have a black box warning. I spoke with Dr. Stephanie Seneff, where we talked about how glyphosate is used on our crops for genetically modified foods, but also used to desiccate the foods at the very end. So you always will be exposed to some level of glyphosate. I also mentioned how it's used in parks and public schools. It's probably public anything, to be honest. If you see Roundup when you're walking into a Home Depot or Lowe's, that thing is glyphosate. To me, what's interesting is that we talk a lot about anti-nutrients and why we don't eat plants for those very reasons. I think a big reason I don't like eating plants is because of all the toxins that they spray on our plants. And even if you get the organic variety, there's a lot of toxins. For example, they use excess copper in a lot of the natural organic herbicides. So if you think about it, is it really that good for you? There are some sprays that are organic that they use on our organic crops, but they work so well that they make a lab version and they don't care and they don't even call it organic. It's quite scary. I also started talking a lot about chronic inflammatory response syndrome. I had Dr. Richie Shoemaker on in episode 149, and he talks a lot about the science behind it. There are a lot of carnivores that are struggling with something beyond the diet. One thing that is really powerful about carnivore is that it takes away a lot of the noise that happens with the diet. So there's no more inflammation from eating gluten or lectins or some other thing. So once you start reducing a lot of that inflammation from foods, you initially feel better, but then there's a plateau and then you don't really feel as good. Or you may be having a histamine response, which actually you should test your C4A marker. If that's happening, usually root cause is never histamine or MCAS. This illness is beyond diet. Yes. A carnivore diet will make you feel so much better. But at a certain point, if you've been exposed to water damage buildings or mold or a tick bite or a recluse spider bite, you may be suffering from a biotoxin that has circulated in your body and your body is not able to remove it on its own. I have seen tremendous healing with SIRS. Now it's a very difficult and expensive illness. So I know it can be daunting for many. But if you are not getting better on a carnivore diet and enough to feel that you will have your life back. It's something you may want to consider always focus on the diet first and try to eat a clean carnivore diet, but long-term it's usually not that you're eating seasonings that you're not fully getting better. I also did a lot of episodes on thyroid function and hormone and stress and balancing electrolytes in episode 108. I interviewed Dr. Stephen Hussey, and he has a new book out on cardiovascular health. 
but he suffered from a heart attack, even though he was eating all the right foods. He doesn't blame it on his diet, but he says that he was not managing the stressors in his life. Yes, you can have a cardiovascular event just from stress. Stress management is so critical to our health. In many episodes, such as with Dr. Charles Hakala or with Dr. Elizabeth Bright, we talk about the importance of iodine and for some people, even selenium for our thyroid function and the importance of fats and meats. In episode 101, I speak with Dr. Rick Malter about the importance of balancing your electrolytes, how he almost had a heart attack because he didn't have sufficient magnesium. Yes, just magnesium. These are so many nuances and it's probably why I put it at the very end. But you want to work with a practitioner. Not every answer is for every single person. I generally look at electrolytes and hair mineral tests to see where people's minerals are, but that often isn't the root cause for other people. Sometimes it's sir, sometimes it's lime, sometimes it's something else. Sometimes it's just excess stress and the body is just overly inundated. And now maybe there needs to be a little bit of mind body rebalancing, such as limbic system or DNRS or EMDR. Everyone's situation is very different, but a lot of healing can happen with the gut. And that's why I focus on a meat only carnivore cure diet to first focus on calming the gut down in the entire nervous system. And when that doesn't become enough, or it doesn't move the lever enough, that's when we can focus on all these other levers. But I think it's easier to just work with someone instead of getting overwhelmed because overwhelm causes stress in the body and overwhelm and stress causes more cortisol release which is never ideal as it's inflammatory, but always, always start with a diet. Number 10, as much as I've interviewed so many different scientists, researchers, medical providers, the biggest takeaway I learned from the last hundred episodes is that stories are so powerful and they are so motivating and they are really what incline other people to try a carnivore diet. As a practitioner, when I share why the mechanisms of the hormones, cortisol, adrenal, thyroid are all affected because of the way that we're living our lives. Yes, sure. It gives them an idea of, okay, so that's why I'm having hot flashes that night, or that's why I've lost my period. While that information is very helpful and how they can use certain levers, it doesn't motivate them the way someone's story of, I lost a hundred pounds. I got off my medication. I've done X, Y, Z on a carnivore diet. In episode 102, I shared Mary Field's story where she is 78 and healing with carnivore. I will be having her on for her 80th birthday and she will share her updates living a carnivorous life. So many people were inspired by her story because through it all, she decided to try carnivore. I also shared the story of Phil Escott, where he shared so much of how he healed his autoimmune illnesses with a ketogenic carnivore diet. He now has more movement than he ever had in such a long time and able to carry drums and play as a musician, even without the perfect circadian rhythm. He shares how much he has healed with a carnivore diet. Brett Lloyd is another person. He and I shared such a similar history. We both struggled with a lot of mental illness and we both have healed with a carnivore diet. Now, I know that not everyone heals fully with the carnivore diet in terms of mental illness, anxiety, depression, but you may want to consider again, sometimes it's SIRS, sometimes it could be an imbalance in the gut. And sometimes you may just need a little bit more support to get that extra level of care to heal mental illness. It would be foolish of me to say that everybody can heal mental illness just because I did on a carnivore diet. My clients challenge me every single time. As you can tell from the summation, I've interviewed incredibly bright and sharp people in the community. These stories to science experts, to updated new research in the carnivore space, there's so much information that you can glean from it. But ultimately, the thing that I always recommend is you have to find what makes sense for you and what will allow you to be consistent long-term. You can learn all the circadian rhythms, all the ways to reduce stress, eat the perfect meats and still not be perfectly perfect. And it could be maybe because you're overly stressed from just even following that regimen. You have to find what works for you. And I know I say that all the time. And I know some people will say, well, what does work for me? And ultimately you have to try different things, maybe work with different providers to figure out what is ultimately your root cause. And that is why I always advocate for root cause. I can give you a supplement that will help you to heal your gut. If that gut healing occurs and then long-term you don't need that supplement, then we found the root cause if you're feeling better. 
if you need a supplement, because that will allow you to sleep and I can give you all the melatonin and I don't agree with that, but if you use other adaptogens that will help your system calm down so you can sleep, sure. Let's use that for a month or two, but if you still need it, even after that, or you need it long-term, then we haven't figured out your root cause. Our bodies have biofeedbacks that tell us, I'm not going to allow you to sleep well because something is off. I'm not going to allow you to digest well because something is off. I'm not going to allow your thyroid to function perfectly where you're still struggling with hypothyroid because something is off. That is the core of why I always say get to root cause healing. And the truth is that not everybody has the same reasons for root cause illness. And so that is why I share a variety of experts and practitioners to hopefully find your root cause, because for everybody, it's different. For me, I was fortunate to find some gut healing and eat more meat when I was plant-based for 12 years. And that provided me healing, but not all of my clients heal that way. Some people figure out that it's been a biotoxin illness. Some people figure out that they need to rewire their brain. Everybody is different, but again, I hope that you glean from me and all these nutrition with Judy experts and interviews and stories that there is hope for healing, that maybe you haven't found your root cause answer, but that doesn't mean that you cannot heal just because there are so many success stories of carnivore and all the magical things it does. Doesn't mean that just because it didn't happen for you right away, that it won't happen for you. Maybe diet is not the only answer. For my clients, a lot of it is not just a perfect carnivore diet. There are other levers and things that we need. And that's okay. I don't think there's a diet that's any better than carnivore. Carnivore allows you to have the most anti-inflammatory diet you can find. Even the SERS providers I work with lately, they are slowly falling in love with carnivore for the same reason, because their illness is based on inflammation. It's safe to say that I've learned a lot in the last hundred episodes and even a hundred before that. And you can be assured that my carnivore cure version two will be a lot different than what it is today. For one, I share that liver is so powerful and we should eat more and more and more in that first version. In all my episodes, I hope that I've instilled hope and giving you levers to find root cause healing. Not everyone has a smooth ride starting with carnivore, but carnivore is ultimately the best diet to start as an elimination diet. I want to leave with the story that I shared in my newsletter the other day. A lot of people don't understand chronic illness. And a lot of people will say people that are suffering from chronic illness, either complain a lot, or they have such a negative view on life, or that they're just simply lazy. And I work with some of the most unwell clients. So let me share a little thing called the spoon theory. The spoon theory was created by a lady named Christine Miserandino. Sorry if I'm pronouncing the name incorrectly, but she explained how chronic illness can be viewed as a set of spoons. You could think of chronic illness sufferers starting their day with a set of spoons. There's a finite amount. Let's just say there's 20 for every task they do, depending on, of course, how their health started that day, every activity and task they do that day will require a certain amount of spoons. Let's say waking up and doing the bed only requires one spoon, but maybe doing the dishes and cleaning the kitchen requires three. And if they only have about 20 spoons in a day, you can see how they become very limited and they have to make a decision. So by the end of the night, maybe they only have one spoon left and they have to decide, am I going to make my child's lunch or am I going to take a bath? And so while many people that live with chronic illness sufferers don't understand, why can't you just get up? A lot of these people will then use spoons from the next day and they'll keep using reserves that should be for the next day. And ultimately they may then have a day where they can't do anything, where they're just bedridden. That's how, if you view chronic illness as a set of spoons, it may allow you to understand how you suffer from chronic illness or how other people that you love suffer from chronic illness. They only have a set of spoons. And if you eat a carnivore diet, oftentimes you have maybe a little bit more spoons than if you were eating a standard American diet. The problem is that carnivore won't give you all the spoons you need to heal forever. Now, for some people, it does like it did for Phil Escott. What I hope to do is that I can keep finding ways to produce more spoons so that you can get to the end of the day and do more of the daily activities and tasks that you want to do in your life. That is me trying to get you to root cause. And we just need to find the places that there are spoons. 
I hope you enjoyed the last hundred episodes that I've shared. It's been my honor and I have learned so much from these experts. Ultimately, find your spoons and know that you can heal. There are just levers and things that you need to do or we need to do as a community to get there. And I will always challenge us to improve until every last person is finding root cause healing. Thank you so much for being part of this journey. I hope that the next hundred even brings more information and support and hope to get to root cause healing. Okay, guys, you know the drill. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Happy 300 episodes.